Hi there. Uh, welcome to the Classical Liberal Project. My name is Danielle. I'm here with Jonathan Casey Hello. Uh, and our, our special guest, uh, Jacob Hornberger, who is running for the Libertarian nomination for president. Hey, hey guys. Nice to be with you and thanks for having me on your program. Thanks for coming. Yeah, on. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> what uh, I know you ran for you, you know, you ran for the nomination four years ago. What made it, what made you what motivated you to run again? Well, uh, if at first you don't succeed, try try again. Um, I really wanted the nomination last time. I fought hard for it. I competed in a lot of the primaries and um, I ended up winning a lot of the debates in the straw polls. And when the convention came along, I got soundly beat. <laughs> no steal the 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 vote for me. I, I lost fair and square. <laughs> and um, but this time around, I, I decided to run again. I, I think that our country is in really bad shape. The Democrats and Republicans are taking us down. The welfare warfare state is taking us down. I have long believed that it is the destiny of the Libertarian Party and the mission of the Libertarian Party to lead America out of this morass of death and suffering and impoverishment and inflation and the war machine and so forth. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to take this message that I took last time uh, back on, uh, on the campaign trail. And last time my quest was to show LP members that this message of principle that I carry and that I would love to, to carry as an, as a nominee is a vote getter. And so I spent a lot of time competing in the libertarian party primaries and I, and I won seven out of 10 of those primaries and came out second in the, in the eighth one. And, and the quest was just to show that this is a sound message. It's a vote getting message. This time around, I decided to do it differently. And so I announced early since last February and on my website at jacobforliberty.com, I've been showing people how it's possible to wage this campaign with this solid principled message without resorting to profanity and macho flash and so forth. And so I've been doing that ever since February. And uh, I look forward to going into the debate season with the uh, South Carolina LP convention in November. Yeah, that's coming up. Yeah. Now, can you talk to me a little bit more about how how your message kind of relates to, to both sides, like how you are going to get those votes from, from Democrat-leaning folks and uh, Republican-leaning folks, or like how your message is maybe different to both sides? Uh, I don't, unlike my opponents for this nomination, I don't target Republicans for votes and I don't target Democrats for votes. I think that's one of the big fallacies that we, we've run reform oriented libertarian presidential candidates for 25 or 30 years now. And the aim has primarily been to target Republicans, disaffected Republicans, the Ron Paul voters and so forth. I think that's been a very fallacious fallacy. And and the voters have rejected this message. I mean, time and time again, we get, you know, 98 to 99 percent of the electorate rejecting this this reform message. And and I'm with them. I mean, I reject the message, too. I will always vote libertarian. I voted for Joe. I voted for Gary. I'll vote for any of my opponents if they defeat me for this nomination. But I reject the, their message. And um, I believe that what we should do is put out a solid message that is based totally 100 percent on principle. I believe that this is a vote getting message. And that's what I proved back in uh, three years ago with winning those primaries. I wanted to show people that in real elections, not just inside the party cocoon like meetings consisting of, you know, 100 people or so, that these were real voters that will vote for this this solid message of principle. I believe that what we should be targeting is not Democrats and Republicans. They're not going to cross party lines in large numbers to vote for a libertarian. But there's a big block of votes out there, like 50 percent of the electorate oftentimes does not vote in elections. That's a goldmine for us. That would be a big targeted area for me. But because so many of them are disgusted with the whole system, but the only way they're going to be shaken to take the time to get up and go vote in this system is if they got a candidate who is against the entire system itself. And that makes the case why this is an evil, immoral welfare warfare state system. When you've got a reform message, which all my opponents have, you can appeal to that segment because they're not going to go for you if they think you're part of the system. The only way they're going to shake 
and move is if they think you're opposing their in, this entire welfare warfare state system. And that's what distinguishes me from my opponents. They target Republicans for votes. I reject that notion. I'm, I'm going after Republicans. They are as responsible for what this country, what the plight this country finds itself in is Democrats. And they need to be taken to task for their, for their measures they've adopted. And I will be targeting that large group of people that don't vote. That's a goldmine for us. That's actually a really good point, Jacob. I do um, a lot of volunteering with a local mutual aid group, and these are all anarchists. Um, they've given up on the system. None of them have voted in years. Um, and and I don't have a candidate that I, I can give them yet. So I'm, I am excited to see what we can give to, to those folks because, yeah, they want to see change, but they just haven't seen anyone worth getting out of their house. We have mail-in ballots in Washington. They don't even go to the mailbox for these candidates. Yeah, they're, they're, they're disaffected. I mean, they're, they're, they're sort of the, the Ron Paul voters and the Donald Trump voters that don't vote. They're, they're, <laughs> you know, they, they just, they're that group of people that are like those voters, but the only people they're going to come out and vote for is somebody that is not part of the system, that rejects the system. And it's not that I'm any great guy, like when I'm on those primaries, it's that people like this message. I'm convinced that this is a vote getting message and that that's what I proved in winning those primaries, that people will come out. I'll give you another example of this. I ran for a U.S. Senate here in Virginia 20 years ago. This was right after 9-11. And I was taking the position, of course, that the U.S. government had had uh, its foreign policy of interventionism had motivated these terrorist attacks. So I was getting, you know, attacked viciously um, for making that position, just as Ron Paul did when he made it in that famous debate. So there was no chance any Republican was ever going to vote for me. Democrats weren't going to vote for me because I stand for the immediate repeal of Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, the whole welfare state. Uh, Democrats didn't even run a, somebody because John Warner, the incumbent governor, was the most popular governor in the history of the state. He had been married to the famous actress Elizabeth Taylor. The LaRouches ran somebody. She obviously got the Democrat vote. I got 7% of the statewide vote. Over 100,000 people, 107,000 people took the time to, uh, to come in and vote for me. Where'd they come from? I mean, they didn't know me. They didn't know me from Adam. Now, I ran a low-cost guerrilla campaign. I got endorsed by an African-American minister who was one of the most highly respected ministers in the country. He, he got elected to the African-American Hall of Fame. And that's another big goldmine of votes for us, Black Americans who have been you know, uh, just vilified by this war on drugs. And uh, so there's another example of where you, this principled message will, re will reverberate, will resound within a large segment of the American population. And that's why I think that's what we ought to be doing in this party. What do you tell somebody when you say, when you tell somebody, uh, a voter, they say, listen, my, my parents are on, on social security. My, my brother is on Medicare. What do you tell them when you say, I want to end it all? What do you, what's the answer to a voter when a voter comes up to you and says, but my family member is on this. They depend on it. What do you tell them? I tell them that you have the opportunity to help your parents out on a voluntary basis. I mean, we see that often where parents or grandparents get into trouble, illness. This is a, this is a tremendous opportunity that children have to pay back what, they, what the parents did for them. And that if the state, if the government wasn't taking so much money from them, from the younger generation to fund these seniors, many of them don't even need the money. I mean, let's face it, there's a lot of wealthy seniors that use the money to buy golf balls or car washes on their Cadillacs. All that money stays with young people. They have a right to have this opportunity to help out their parents. There is no care and compassion in this program. What, where is the care and compassion with the IRS? Where is the care and compassion of some, some social security bureaucrats? So they lay this guilt trip off on young people saying, oh, gosh, your parents... They're entitled to this money. And it, that's all it is, is a guilt trip. The thing about us libertarians is that we believe in freedom. We know that freedom works. You can repeal Social Security today and everybody would be fine tomorrow. 
but they create this mindset of helpless dependency among everybody where people get so scared. Oh my God, there'd be people dying in the streets if this socialist program were repealed. That's pure nonsense. Parent, most children respond favorably when their parents and grandparents are in, in need. If they don't, you've got church groups. You've got ameliocenary groups. You would undoubtedly have the foundation for the former Social Security recipients that would be generously funded by wealthier people. That's the faith that we need to restore in this country, the faith in freedom, voluntary charity, and free markets, and get rid of this faith in the power of the state and the coercive apparatus of the state. And that's what I would tell young people. I love that answer. I think, I think what I often wonder how much the cost of medicine would have come down had we not gotten government so deeply involved in this. So you know, pay, uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul uh, with our with Medicare and and Social Security. I just I, I I dream of about a world where we have all these great advancements, but the cost of medicine is going up so high. It's like guys, because government is involved in these things, that's that's why the cost is going up. So I wish I wish I wish we had more candidates out there speaking that exact exact message. If you give me an opportunity, I would like to address that exact point that you it. just made. Uh, what you say, uh, Jonathan, is absolutely correct. I grew up in the 1950s, and what we were told was the poorest city in the United States, us so Laredo, Texas, on the border. Now they're doing well now, but back then. Lots of poverty, deep poverty. Every, this was before Medicare and Medicaid, which were enacted in 65, I believe. Every day, doctor's offices in Laredo were filled. The only hospital in town was, was Mercy Hospital, a Catholic hospital, relied a lot on donations. There was never an instance, from what I understand, of a doctor turning away any patient for inability to pay. And they knew that half the patients, if not more than the patients that were there, would never pay them, could never pay them. Sometimes patients would bring tamales or chickens or something to mm -hmm. give to the doctor. And the doctors were still the, the second wealthiest people in town because from the people that were paying, the wealthiest were the oil people. But and, and prices were low and they were stable. Going to the doctor was like going to the grocery store. Nobody had medical insurance because they didn't need it. You just pay your medical bill like a like a grocery bill. Once Medicare and Medicaid came into and it was the finest healthcare system in history. You had innovations taking place. Doctors loved what they were doing. Many of them made house calls. Medicare and Medicaid came into existence and destroyed the whole system. That's when healthcare costs started soaring because all of a sudden you have this huge artificial demand on the system. And that's what ended up destroying that finest healthcare system in history. And so all you have now is all these reform measures, including among libertarian presidential candidates, you know, health savings accounts and so forth, because they cannot bring themselves to say, to get rid of cancer, which is what this system is, you've got to eradicate cancer. Just excise it out, repeal this program immediately, and you would immediately have the the, the foundation for this vibrant, dynamic, charitable healthcare system once again. It's the only solution to this healthcare morass. Well, and as, if you got the, as you know, a presidential candidate, if you were elected president, you could get the federal government out of it. And if the states decided to do something, you'd have 50, you know, 50 different examples of, of, of how to handle those situations. So it's like, you know, we, we, we don't need the federal government of all governments to be the last one that gets involved with, with, uh, with these decisions, right? Right. And I, I think if you, if you ever bring a shift in public opinion to get rid of these two socialist programs, along with Social Security, these are all socialist programs. I mean, socialism has been the bane of mankind along with its out-of-control spending and debt and monetary debauchery. I think that that mindset would then transfer to the states as well. I mean, you're right. Each state would develop its own system. But my hunch is that once the federal government uh, gets out of this system because of public popular opinion, that mindset's going to manifest itself on the state level too. And people are going to be going to a free market healthcare system. The free market produces the best of everything. We know that it would produce the best, best healthcare system again, as it once did before these socialist programs were enacted. Yeah. I mean, we saw, yeah, like you said, it created a great amount of innovation and and access as well. You could just walk into a doctor. And we're seeing some of that now with some more direct pay, um, direct pay offices where you're directly paying the doctor. Uh, you're getting the insurance companies out of it because they've, you know, and when insurance and government get in bed together, we all we all seen the results, uh, results of that. 
Uh, you grew up in Laredo, Texas, so you were right on the border. One of your your staunch policies is opening opening the border. Would you have absolutely no control over who crosses the border? Would you have you know some type of inspections, Ellis Island style? Lay it out what your what your vision there is. The exact same system we have crossing state borders, which is no controls at all. You, you you're free to cross from Maryland into Virginia. You cross the Potomac River. You never encounter a border inspection station at all. Just the free movements of people across borders. I grew up on the border. I spent almost half my life there. I know border life. I've seen the deaths. I've seen the suffering. Uh, I've seen the police state. I mean, I have, I've experienced firsthand the police state. We, I grew up on a farm on the Rio Grande and we hired illegal immigrants on our farm. The border patrol could come in without a warrant, a search warrant, anytime it wanted onto our farm. And if we put a, a lock on the gate uh, from the highway that adjoined our, our farm, they would just shoot it off if we hadn't given them a, a, a key. And then they've got highway checkpoints along the, the border. You leave Laredo and you, you go about 40 miles and you go over the crest of a hill and you think you're still in Mexico because there's this huge immigration station there where they can search you 100 percent, even if you've never gone into Mexico. So you get this police state, you get all this death and suffering and you get the crisis. I've seen this ongoing crisis all my life, and everybody thinks he's got a plan, including my opponents for the uh, for the presidential nomination. They all have plans. It's how they're going to fix this system. It cannot be fixed. It is inherently defective. There is a reason why you've had this ongoing crisis decade after decade after decade, and that's because this is a system that's founded on socialist principles of central planning. You've got government officials establishing quotas, credentials, numbers, uh, everything. And that's central planning. And that's why you have a crisis. The only solution, and I've emphasized this for about 50 years or so, the only 40 years, the solution is open the borders to the free movements of good services and people. Immediately, there would be no crisis. I mean, it's like the drug war. You know, if you want to get rid of the drug cartels, the secret is not to keep waging war against the drug cartels. The secret is to legalize drugs, and the, that puts the drug cartels out of business. If you want to get rid of the immigration crisis, you legalize the free movements of people across borders. Tomorrow, nobody would know there was a crisis because there wouldn't be a crisis. People would simply be crossing the border. You would be interacting with people without knowing what their citizenship is. You don't care today what people's citizenship is. You don't ever ask somebody back in McDonald's, can I see your papers to make sure you're, you're an American? And that's the way it would work. The, the, the crisis would disappear today along with the death, suffering, misery, police state, and all of the other horrific, tyrannical things that come with this system. What do you, what do you tell somebody who, you know, the, the oft-heard argument of, well, you have to end the welfare state first before you open the borders. What, what do you tell somebody? That's pure nonsense. No, you don't. You, you, you don't infringe on people's freedom. And, and an essential aspect of freedom is the right of travel. And crossing a border does not involve the initiation of force against anyone. It doesn't involve the initiation of, of violating somebody else's rights. When I cross a border into the next county, Fairfax County, I live here in Virginia, I'm not violating anybody's rights. And so the fact that there's a welfare state in California that's bigger than the welfare state in Alabama doesn't mean that we should put Im immigration controls on California to prevent people from Alabama moving into California, that if you want to stop people from going on welfare, there's a very simple solution. Foreigners are not entitled to go on welfare. Bam, it, that problem's over. Now, of course, we libertarians would get rid of the welfare, or at least I would, not, not my uh, opponents for this nomination. They, they believe in Social Security and Medicare and so forth. But I, I favor the eradication of those programs, but we don't want to join up with people that are violating people's rights just because of the possibility that a very small minority are going to go on welfare. In fact, most immigrants come here to work. They want to get wealthy. They know you don't get wealthy on welfare. and You get wealthy by starting a business or working for a business. So I say that's just pure nonsense. And An example of this, uh, Jonathan, is we take the drug war. Okay. I, as a libertarian, I favor the total legalization of all drugs. Now, what if somebody comes to me and says, oh, no, Jacob, a lot of these drug addicts are going to go on Medicaid to get treatment if we legalize drugs. And so we can't legalize drugs until we legalize, uh, until we get rid of Medicaid. 
Well, that could be 50 years. We want to keep, we're going to, libertarians are going to start calling for keeping the drug war in existence because it might result in, in higher taxes. I say, no, if it results in higher taxes, so be it. But let us never join Democrats and Republicans in their support of tyranny. Yeah, there's no justification for, for continuing arresting people and putting them in jail. Uh, there, you know, that, that's, a, that's a trade-off we can't make, right? Exactly. That we should never trade our principles simply because it might pinch us in the form of higher taxes. And that's really the welfare state argument. What they're really saying is they're going to come get on welfare and that's going to mean higher taxes for me. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be the case because Congress can say that foreigners are not entitled to welfare. But if it did result in higher taxes, I'd pay the higher taxes than compromise or abandon my principles simply because it's pinching me in the pocketbook. A lot of people have paid a much higher price for their principles and for liberty than that. Absolutely. I, I always love it when Republicans claim, you know, they're, they're well, on one hand, they claim that immigrants are coming to take their jobs. And then on the other, they're claiming to be welfare, welfare, welfare recipients. It's like, well, they got to choose one of those, don't they? <laughs> hey, that's great. I hadn't thought about that one. That's, that's, a, that's an awesome argument. Exactly. I, may, I may use that. There you go. Now, Jacob, do you mind if I switch gears just a little bit um, to more internal politics? Um, I think a lot of people um, had the criticism of Joe Jorgensen's campaign that it took too long to get up and running. Say you are nominated uh, today. What are we doing tomorrow to get you up to speed to be our libertarian presidential nominee? Do you have your branding and all that all, all solidified? Well, first of all, I, I question that. You no, know, it may be true about Joe's campaign, but I, I don't think that was the fundamental problem. And, and it's not a personal thing either. Joe and I are friends and we were friends throughout the campaign. And I certainly wished her well. I endorsed her after I lost because I like Joe. Joe, you can't help but like Joe. She's She's a really nice person. And I didn't keep track of her campaign. It may have been tardy getting geared up, but that wasn't the problem. The problem is the message. It, it's the same message that's been cast in this party for the last 25 or 30 years. It's a message that 98.9% .9 of American voters rejected. And, and I'm with them. I'm with those 99%. I reject Joe's message too. It's a bad message. It's, it's a boring message. It doesn't inspire. It doesn't get people excited. Uh, I think the only thing, well, I know the only thing that gets me excited is a, a campaign of principle where people are talking about instead of a voucher program for improving the public school system, separating school and state. Now you're getting my attention. And what I say is that there's, there's a period of time after the presidential candidate gets the nomination where the national media is focusing in on the libertarian presidential candidate. They're contacting for interviews. They, they want to know more. And that lasts for about three to four weeks. That's your opportunity to get in there and immediately make an interesting campaign. Open the borders, abolish Social Security, abolish Medicare. That's the type of message that creates its own momentum because people start talking about it. They start attacking it. Oh, can you believe that the libertarian wants to get rid of these welfare state programs um, or dismantle the CIA, the Pentagon, the NSA, restore a limited government republic with just a basic military? That's where we need to hit the, ball, the, the, the ground running with the sound message because the message itself will produce an interesting campaign. Look at Bobby Kennedy Jr., now, I don't agree with most of what he stands for. He's a big government liberal Democrat, a gun gun control guy. But you can't deny he's running a very interesting campaign. He, he's certainly not scared to condemn the CIA, and including its assassination of his uncle. Uh, yet we have candidates in this party for president that are scared to death to condemn the CIA and its, its dark side activities. Well, Kennedy's running an interesting campaign and look at how much media he gets simply because he's running that interesting campaign. That's what I say is that let's focus on the message in this party. Let's run a presidential candidate, i.e. me, that that fights with who we are as libertarians, with our weapons being our principles. Forget all the reform stuff. Get rid of Social Security immediately. That will generate, I hold, 
the enthusiasm and the interest among this big block of voters that I'm talking about. If you can shake that block of voters, the people that don't vote, where they start to move, then all of a sudden you're going to see some really dramatic action taking place for the Libertarian Party in this presidential race. Is there is there a past Libertarian Party candidate that you would look at and go, I really liked the way that campaign was run or that message was run? Is there somebody in the past that you could point to and say, that would be somebody I would really like to be able to emulate or I liked how they did that, how they messaged? Uh, well, I wasn't involved in the party in the early days. I, I, I joined the party in 90 when I was asked to join the platform committee and I served three terms in the platform committee. But ever since... I've been in the party. No, the answer to your question is no, because there's always been this like plan to save social security uh, or a a reluctance to talk about open immigration um, or, or repealing Medicare or dismantling the national. I I don't know of any presidential candidate that has talked about dismantling the national security establishment, restoring a limited government Republic, which is really the key to ending all their forever wars. Uh, so t- to answer your question, no, we, we haven't run a campaign of pure principle in the presidential race for at least 30 years. Now, it may have happened before. You know, um, it, it could be. I don't think Clark did. Clark seemed pretty moderate. Uh, and then I'm just looking back. I wasn't actively involved then. Uh, Berglund might have. I don't know. Uh, but in the last 25 or 30 years, I think it's been a disaster in terms of messaging. Gotcha. Now, let's say one of the other candidates won the presidential nomination. And right now, we for sure, we've spoken with Lars, Chase, and Mike. Um, do we have other people running that we should consider, or should we just stick with those three? If one of those three won, um, how would you slide into the VP role? Are you Are you okay if someone like... Chase already has everything down pat and they just want you to go along with their message. Could you do that? Uh, well, I should mention that Josh Smith is running too. Ooh, okay. Okay. Um, no, I'm not interested in the pre- vice presidential candidacy and I wasn't interested last time. You know, I'm, I really want to be the, the presidential nominee of the party. The, the presidential nominee sets the tone for the party. And if any of these other uh, people win the nomination as Joe did in, in three years ago, I would endorse them. Absolutely. And I will vote for them. I just, I can't get excited about their message and I wouldn't do them any good as their vice presidential candidate because they need somebody that matches up with their message. If they're calling for reform of these welfare state, warfare state programs, they want a reformer that's going to match up with their program. I'd be the last person that would be able to do that. But Like I say, I I wouldn't get enthusiastic about their message. I would reject their message, but I would vote for them and I would certainly endorse them. Nice. You've got um, obviously uh, um, a big, big issue for libertarians is is uh, reforming the Fed, ending the Fed. What would you do in the Fed right away? Just overnight. What's your what's your monetary policy? Yeah, um, well, I take it further than than all the other candidates. uh, I'm sure it wouldn't surprise you. the, the, the second best monetary system is the monetary system that we had in our country for more than 100 years. And that was established by the Constitution. It was a gold coin, silver coin standard. Uh, contrary to popular opinion, there was never paper money backed by gold. There was gold <laughs> coins and silver coins. That was the money. The, there were instruments of indebtedness. But those everybody understood bonds, bills and notes were promises to pay money, which was the gold coins and silver coins. Second best monetary system in history. That was destroyed by Franklin Roosevelt when he nationalized gold and make it a, made it a felony offense without even the semblance of a constitutional amendment. So that's my second best. But the best is the, the system that advocated by Friedrich Hayek, the Austrian Nobel Prize winning economist. Separate money and state. Hayek called the denationalization of money. Get government entirely out of the monetary sphere. You, you know, we, we've just we we've we've all been born and raised under a system where we just accept that government ha- should be establishing what the money is. 
the free market produces the best of everything. Let the free market produce the monetary system that people want. If people want to use gold coins or silver coins or bitcoins or American Express banknotes, they're free to do that in the marketplace. And that would produce the finest monetary system in history. And so that's the message that I would take to the American people, which I think, again, makes an interesting campaign instead of saying, well, I'm going to reform the system or I'm going to abolish the Fed. I mean, abolishing the Fed or in the Fed was made really popular by Ron Paul. Uh, and we've copied it ever since. But it's kind of like trite at this point. It's like, ah, oh, you know, boring. <laughs> uh, an exciting message to me is, Let's get government and totally out of the monetary field and establish a free market. I think that's the type of thing that gets the interest of, of people. We've gone a long, we've gone a hundred years in the Western world of governments being in charge of their of their own money printers. And I, uh, I would, I would hope that in my lifetime it happens that we get them out of control of the money printers. Uh, I certainly hope that. We'll see. Well, that's an interesting point you raised because, you know, a lot of libertarians have given up. Um, when, when I was your age, there was um, people, the older people, the people my age now saying, oh, we can't achieve liberty in our lifetime. It, it, it all lies with you young people. We're putting our faith in you young people. And I'm sitting there saying, you know, that's just a cop out because they're saying, oh, well, we can get liberty in 50 years from now. And I thought, OK, well, let me see. That puts me at 77. And. We can achieve liberty now in our lifetime here in my lifetime right now. But if you give up and you say, oh, no, Jacob, we have to phase out Social Security over the next 50 years. You've given up because you cannot be free when you're living under socialism. And so that's another position that I will be making in this campaign if I win this nomination is that we want to go for freedom right now. We want a free society. I don't want you know, getting freedom in 25 or 50 years doesn't interest me. It, it may have interested me when I was your age, uh, but, you know, it really shouldn't interest you either. You'll be, what, 60 or 70 or something at that point. Mm -hmm. We need to make the case for freedom now because freedom works. Think how exciting it would be to live in a genuinely free society. It's got to be an exhilarating feeling. That's what we got to go for, Jonathan. We, we, can't, we can't settle for freedom 50 years from now. I can't, I can't say I'm not excited by that, uh, that prospect. <laughs> I, I can only imagine what it feels like for somebody to immigrate here from a more repressive country to feel that freedom in, that we have in America. I can only imagine the next step, right, of, 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 of enjoying even more freedom uh, and, and prosperity that we would see under a, under a truly free market, a free market society. Well, my favorite period in history, I, I, I kind of wish I, I would have been born in that system was 1890 to 1910. It's got to be an, an incredible period, even though, you know, they didn't have the innovations we have, computers, air conditioning, and so forth. But think, no income tax, no IRS, no Federal Reserve, gold coins and silver coins, the official money, no immigration controls, no gun control, no military industrial complex, no Pentagon, CIA, NSA, just a limited government republic with a basic military force. I mean, this is an incredible system. Inventions were coming into existence every day. People were flooding into America. Now, there was negatives. There was Jim Crow that was starting to rise up, and you still right. had the remnants of slavery. But by and large, that to me is our model that we need to build on. If they could achieve that, so can we. And you mentioned you mentioned Jim Crow laws, but even in that that time period after con Reconstruction, is you saw a, a massive improvement in in black wealth and black uh, prosperity. They were building businesses, they were building their own towns, they were having a great amount of prosperity until the Jim Crow laws really started to 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 take effect. You know, a lot of people in the South were realizing that they were being successful, and so they used those laws to to batten you know batten that down. I mean, you had multiple you know black congressmen during that time period. There was a great improvements to be that were being made in strides in in, in uh, racial equality, and then government got involved not only in the economic side of things, but in the the, the Jim. We started enforcing more Jim Crow laws, um, and yeah, we we entered a dark a dark period. Really, uh, kind of right you know right in World War One started, going all the way through to the end of World War Two. That that entire period, we kind of we really we really uh, regressed in a lot of areas. During that, in, during that entire period. 
Well, your point about blacks, black people is absolutely right on it. it, it you, you're absolutely right. OK, here's an ex example of the reform mentality. Suppose we get magically transported back to 1855 Alabama, along with all my re opponents for this nomination. Well, there would be the reformers that say, Jacob, we have to call for reform of slavery. We're never going to end slavery. It's not practical. We, we have to get elected public office, Jacob. But we're going to make a difference. So we have to settle for slavery reform, uh, fewer lashings, uh, better work conditions, better health care for the slaves. And, and oh, and it would be cruel to just free the slaves overnight because they don't have a work ethic. They don't know what it's like to open a business and so forth. So, Jacob, we have to gradually phase out slavery over 50 years. My argument, absolutely not. You you end slavery immediately, which is what happened when, when the North won. And you're right. Immediately, Blacks started forming their own businesses. They started prospering. There's, there's a lady, I forget her name, but she was a hairdresser. And she ended up uh, having a mansion in, in, Terry, in, in uh, Westchester County, New York. They had a documentary about her. I forget her name now. But a Black woman who was a multimillionaire. And, and they were establishing schools. And I mean, it shows you that when you free people, there's a vibrancy that takes place. And you are absolutely right. The reason white people, especially in the South, started passing Jim Crow laws cause, was because they were getting out competed by the black people. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. No, it's, it's pretty it's pretty wild what greed does to uh, I mean, the, it's socialism is founded on greed. It's, it's ironic because everyone accuses capitalism of being founded on greed. But in reality, socialism is the is greed and, and uh, uh, envy of what other people have. Right. That is really the foundational movement behind uh, behind a lot of socialist tendencies to control other people, to control what they have, to you know cut the top off, to redistribute. Uh, it, it's it's pretty amazing that capitalism gets accused of exactly what these socialist tendencies uh, are a result of. Yeah, it, it's a direct violation of God's commandment. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. And, and that's the driving force of this equalization argument. Oh, the, wealth ha the wealthy have too much money. Well, if the wealthy have acquired their money legitimately by selling goods and services that other people are willing to pay for, what business do people have coveting that or trying to take it away from them? And it really turns out to be legalized stealing. Uh, and and in a, in a, a genuine libertarian society where you have wealth, you have no income tax, so people are free to accumulate unlimited amounts of wealth. Yeah, there's huge wealthy multi billionaires, but the fact is that the people at the bottom of the economic ladder also have a very high high standard of living. So if you can overcome your your sense of covetousness, you you everybody grows. Well, if you let that covetousness be ingrained into your political system, you start bringing everybody down, especially the ones at the bottom of the economic ladder. Absolutely. Um, one of the criticisms I, I, I personally have, and I've seen other people have, of kind of the um, all or nothing approach, uh, the anti-moderate uh, anti approach, anti-incrementalism approach, is that it doesn't, in history, most most movements toward freedom are incremental. There are clearly leaps and bounds, but sometimes, but most movements in history, I would argue, typically happen over time. What would you, what would you say, what would you say to that? I'd say that you, you can't, you can't worry about how things ferret out. I mean, we know as a practical matter, let's say repealing social security is, is a practical matter. It would take time to convince enough congressmen to repeal this program. That should not interfere with the moral message that we take to the American people, that you have to end this program and make the case for ending the program or making the case for um, ending uh, border controls, for example, even though as a practical matter, it won't happen today. Drug legalization. OK, you know, they, they might say, well, let's start with marijuana first and then go cocaine and then heroin then opioids or fentanyl or whatever. But we have to make the case for the elimination of all these laws and then let the other part just ferret it out. It's like the example with slavery. It, it might've been uh, slave slavery without the civil war. It might've been phased out over a period of time, but the moral message has to be made to people of what freedom really means. And that's the role of the libertarian party. We've got to communicate to people. This is what a genuinely free society is. This is the goal line. 
it, we may not be able to reach there today, but that's what we need to be aiming for. So if you were, if you were president and um, a bill came across your desk that uh, instead of completely open borders, we just, we reopened Ellis Island. It wouldn't be completely open borders, but it'd be a big step towards it. You would, you would say, sign that bill saying, yes, we reopen Ellis Island, even though it's not completely open borders. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I obviously you, you you have to go along with it, measures that improve the system, but you constantly have to be making the case that this is not sufficient. Uh, I mean, it, it'd be foolish if 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 the Congress enacts um, a fifty percent reduction in federal spending and a fifty percent reduction in the income tax and a balanced budget to say, well, I'm not going to sign this because it's not everything. But what you can do is sign it at the same time as saying this is not sufficient. This is not for a free society. And you keep pushing for the eradication of the income tax at all, if, if necessary, through a constitutional amendment, repealing the 16th Amendment. Uh, but you, you've got to continue making the case so that people can understand what that case is. It, they're, 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 one of the people that had a big influence on me was Leonard Reed, the founder of the Foundation for Economic Education. And Reed once said in one of his books that, look, if you shoot for the moon, you might hit the moon, but you also might run short, hit short of it. While if you shoot for the stars, then you're almost certain to get the moon and a lot more in, 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 as part of that. So we got to shoot for the stars when it comes to freedom. We can't settle for some halfway measures. I love it. <laughs> Danielle, did you have any other questions? Now, for full disclosure for our listeners. Now, we're recording this on 9, on 9-12, September 12th. Um, do you have any thoughts on 9-11 or maybe, I don't know, criticisms on the aftermath? Just, you know, to be relevant culturally, I suppose. <laughs> I have tremendous criticisms. In fact, I just wrote a, a blog on it that we have to constantly remind ourselves that th these attacks were not motivated by hatred for America's freedom and values. That was the official narrative. And so everybody says, oh, my gosh, you know, rally to the government, rally to the troops, support the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq. And I was one of those that said, absolutely not. What we need to do is reexamine foreign policy because it was foreign policy that gave rise to the anger and hatred that motivated these attacks. And by foreign policy, I'm talking about, for example, the Persian Gulf War, where the U.S. massacred massive amounts of Iraqis, but even more important, then imposed a, one of the most brutal systems of economic sanctions in history on the Iraqi people, which was not only impoverishing them on a, on a daily basis, but was more important contributing to their deaths of their children. Uh, the, the Pentagon had bombed water and sewage treatment plants during the Gulf War, knowing that this would spread infectious illnesses. The sanctions prevented them from repairing these plants. And so children, Iraqi children, were dying in the 1990s at the rate of hundreds of thousands a year. And when Madeleine Albright, was the, she was the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations in 96, she was asked by 60 Minutes, whether the deaths of half a million Iraqi children were worth it. And by it, they meant trying to get rid of Saddam Hussein, the dictator of Iraq, who ironically had been a partner and ally of the U.S. in the 1980s. She said, oh, yeah, it's worth it. I mean, so she's not questioning that half a million children had been killed by the sanctions, and she's saying it's worth it. <laughs> uh, so if that doesn't generate anger and rage, I mean, look what happened when those kids got killed in Uvalde. It was tremendous anger and rage, and rightly so. Imagine how the Iraqi people and people in the Middle East felt when they saw these hundreds of thousands of children dying every year, and three high UN officials resigned and said, we will not participate in this, in this genocide, they called it. So then you've got the attack on the 1993, uh, 1993 on the World Trade Center by Ramsey Youssef and others. Youssef goes to the federal judge at sentencing and says, you call me a terrorist, you're the butchers. Look how you're killing these children in Iraq. Uh, the same thing with that guy, uh, Mir, um, Mir, something or other, uh, that shot those CIA officials outside CIA headquarters. He said the same thing. Look at the children you're, you're killing. There was the attack on the USS Cole, the attack uh, on the, East, on the, Af the U.S. embassies in East Africa. Then come the 9-11 attacks, and, and they had been warned. 
Uh, there's a great book called Blowback by Chalmers Johnson, a former CIA analyst. Before the 9-11 attacks, it said, if you continue doing this, there's going to be a major attack on U.S. soil. And they just ignored it. And so that's the message I'm going to give is that we need to do a serious soul searching in this country and stop this foreign interventionism, which is the root cause of the anti-American terrorism, which is the root cause of the war on terrorism, which is the root cause of the destruction of our liberties with the Patriot Act and state-sponsored assassinations, torture, indefinite detention, Guantanamo Bay. Uh, look what's happening with Julian Assange and Edward Snowden. Um, that's the message of 9-11 here is that we need to do some serious soul searching as to where we are as a country, how we got here and what we need to do to get out of this morass. Absolutely. I was, I was 14 or 15 when the, when the planes hit and I was uh, for about three or four years after I was a little, a little horrible neocon. And then I realized there weren't any weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And I was, I, I started listening to Ron Paul and started getting, you know, I started to wake up about these things and realized, wait a second, the things are not as I've been told. So I think we need, I think we need the, uh, need to get that message out there to wake more people up about these things that we have, that we have created a lot of the problems in this, in this, in this world with our foreign, our foreign intervention. So. Yeah. But see um, the fact, the fact that it impacted you. And when I discovered libertarianism, it was like a road to Damascus experience. This is encouraging for me when, when I see we're just regular people. And if we can achieve this breakthrough, anybody can achieve this breakthrough. But it takes the truth to do that. And that's why I keep saying that our biggest asset in this party are our principles. That if we, if we keep sticking with our principles, more and more people will break through and join up with us. I love it. Uh, where, where can people find you? Where, where do you want people to sign up? Take a look at your campaign. Uh, uh, Jacob, you Jacobforliberty.com. And they will see the long series of videos that I've been putting up there since February attacking Biden and, and Trump and DeSantis and Kennedy and all the rest of them, not from a personal standpoint. I'm trying to show people, hey, look, you can, you can go after both Democrats and Republicans with these principles without the macho flash, the profanity, the inflammatory statements. But then starting in November, I will be shifting gears because now everything's going to be focused internally on the Libertarian Party. But up to that point, I plan to just keep concentrating on these Democrats and Republicans and, and going on the attack against their positions uh, and then in, shift gears in November. So jacobforliberty.com is where everybody can keep track of what I'm doing. Awesome. Well, I, I appreciate you coming on. This has been a fun, fun conversation. I always appreciate, I always appreciate your perspective on things and, and great. Oh, my pleasure too. I really enjoyed the conversation and thanks for having me on and thanks for letting me talk and give my perspective. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for your time. And you can find us at lpclc.org and get on our uh, in our Discord and get connected that way. Uh, have a have a good rest of your day, everyone.